take two. <clears throat> so remember, up to now, we have described this in terms of the universal thermon formalism a la Maldesina Ogori, in terms of an SL2R level K plus SU2. That's the ADS3 cross the 3 bit, and then the T4 is the DT4. So if I put the T4, would add here u1 to the to the four, and uh, and that uh, I mean we more or less got uh, a good description of the physical spectrum and could show that it looks like that of the symmetric orbifold or the single particle piece of the symmetric orbifold, but we had some problems because we were interested in level the k equals to one theory, and there were basically two problems. First of all. This theory is a bit delicate at level one, because once you decouple the fermions, it gets level minus one. And then we couldn't really understand which representation we should keep here. And there were a few things that were a bit dodgy. So today what we're going to do is we're going to use another formulation for string theory in ADS3 plus the 3 plus T4, which is the so-called hybrid formalism. So this, is, uh, this formalism was developed by Maldesino and Oguri. And this is uh, due to Berkowitz, Waffa, and Witten. And the idea of the hybrid formalism is that you, in some sense, you go from the neve schwartz ramon sector to the Green-Schwartz description. What that amounts to is that you replace the piece that describes ADS3 cross S3 by a supergroup by Sermino witten model based on PSU 1, 1 slash 2 at level k. And then the, you have uh, the T4 theory. But what you have to do is you have to topologically test the T4 theory. That's just a, a fancy way of saying that you change the conformal dimensions of the fermions so that two of them become conformal dimension one and two of them become conformal dimension zero. And then the physical spectrum here is described by a certain BRST cohomology. So the physical spectrum here is described by the BRST cohomology, a certain defined of this uh, world sheet theory. And there is uh, very good evidence and work to demonstrate that these two descriptions are really equivalent to one another. I mean, this hasn't been proven. Part of the problem is it's very hard to really solve this BRST cohomology honestly, so it's very difficult to know exactly what the spectrum here is. But uh, a former student of mine, Sebastian Gehrig, and uh, Jan Trost have worked out the low-lying states here for values of k and checked that it agrees with the physical spectrum from here. Yes. Is there some simple argument on the level of Lie algebras to see that this could be the same? Yes, I mean, so, so, so the hybrid formalism starts from here and then does some field redefinitions, bosonizing, formalizing, but it's a sort of Berkowitz type argument. So you take every field and it gets bosonized and then it gets fermionized and it's bosonized and fermionized and you find the handle and at the end you get this. But your direction on the level of Lie algebras is there some way of seeing that this could be related? Well, it's really like going from the Neve schwartz ramon formalism to the Green-Schwartz formalism. So the fermions here sit in the adjoint representation, and as I'll explain to you in a second, the fermions here sit in the bispinner representation. So it's really, the Lie algebras are definitely not the same. Uh -huh. Right, so I mean here, remember the fermions sit in the adjoint representation. And uh -huh. here, so what is PSU 1, 1 slash 2? So this is a super Lie algebra, so if I write it as a super Lie group, what it will look like is SL2R and SU2. So SL2R is really the same as SU1,1. So that this is a this factor and this is a this factor. Okay, but there are these two groups. I didn't know this fact. So, so these two groups are in there. These two groups are in there, but then here you have the fermions. And the fermions that sit in there sit in by spinner representations. Whereas here, the fermions sit in the adjoint representation. And that's very much like going from the Neve Schwartz. So the Neve Schwartz from one formalism, the fermions sit in the vector representation of SO8. And in the Green Schwartz formulation, the fermions sit in the spinner representation of SO8. And here, correspondingly, they sit in the adjoint representation of what is the analog of the rotation group in the space time. And here, they sit in the spinner representation. So it's like in going from Neve Schwartz from one to Green Schwartz, it's not the same. The world sheet spheres are definitely not equivalent. But the 
physical spectrum, once you've done the correct cohomology here, reproduces the physical spectrum as you copy the standard string theory method in it. Well, except you have to be a little bit careful. You see, this is the, this is the, the coupled one. So we have to decouple the fermions. The levels get shifted, whereas here there is no way of coupling or decoupling them. So they, these both have level K. If you sit here at level K, and there is a good evidence that this description at level K is exactly the same, gives you exactly the same string theory as this description at level K. But it hasn't been proven that there is a sort of physics type argument to go from here to here, and people have checked it, and it seems to work. So the key point here is that while this theory is K equals to 1 is a bit problematic, here there is no difficulty whatsoever with taking this theory at K equals to 1. What you have to do is we have to study the representation theory of this affine super Lie algebra. But that's something we can do. And in fact, you can easily see, and that's what I'm about to explain to you, what happens at level 1 for P as U1, 1, 1 slash 2. So, okay, so, so let's think about it. So this has uh, six bosonic degrees of freedom, six bosonic generators, maybe they get three from here and three from here. And then the fermions sit in by spinners, so there are four entries here and four entries here, so there are altogether eight fermions. And the eight fermions sit in by spinner representation with respect to SO2R cross SU2. Why four and four? Well, because I mean, this, is a, this is a two by two block, and this is a two by two block, right? Uh -huh. so this is a two by two block, this is a two by two block, so it has four entries. Mm -hmm. And then, because there is one 4 by 4 and one 4 by 4 block, so 4 plus 4 is 8. So they are complex. For real? Well, okay, so, I mean, I mean, as a Lie algebra, I mean, uh, there are 8 fermionic generators and 6 bosonic generators. You can look at the real Lie algebra, you can look at the complex Lie algebra. In some sense. Sorry, by spinner means just the fundamental of SO2 times fundamental right, so, of SO2. Yes, so, so, so they are labeled by alpha, beta, gamma where alpha is a spinner index with respect to the SL2, beta is a spinner, so alpha and beta and gamma all take values in plus and minus. Alpha transforms on a spinner under the two-dimensional representation. Two-dimensional representation of SL2, two-dimensional representation of SU2, which is also SL2 if you wish, and then this gamma index is a linear combination of the two of diagonal. Okay, so now you can ask what do the highest rate representations of PSU, PSU 1, 1 slash 2, so this is an affine Katsmudi algebra, so we have all of these generators and then we have, we have an affine version of it, right? We have uh, alpha, beta, gamma, n, and then we have j, a, n, and k, a, n. So this is the SL2 affine, this is the SU2 affine, and these are these fermionic generators. But from the point of view of the world sheet, they're all spin one fields. So it's a super Lie algebra, so they're Lie algebra generators, so they're spin one fields, but they satisfy anti-commutation relations rather than commutation. I mean, they behave like terms. But do you need to be a group representation? So no. No, I mean, it's algebra. Lie algebra. So now I can ask, what are the highest rate representations of this uh, affine Katsmudi algebra. So what I have in mind is I have, so I'm looking, so by highest weight, I always mean Verosoro highest weight. So I'm looking at sort of the, the ground state, if I think of writing it in terms of L0. So I'm looking at the states that are annihilated by all the positive modes. So what I mean by that, annihilated by all positive modes. Verosoro is Shugawara construction. Yes. Yes, and the, and, the, and the Verosoro algebra actually has c equals to minus 2 independent of k because the dual Coxter number of the super Lie algebra is 0. So then the central charge is the super dimension, which is 6 minus 8, which is minus 2 times k divided by k. So it's just minus 2. But uh, that doesn't play a role in what I'm about to explain. Okay, so we are asking what do these possible highest weight states look like? Now, Obviously, they are going to fall into representations of SL2 and SU2. So I can write them as a direct sum of SL2 plus SU2 representations, 
But then, remember, I have eight fermionic zero modes. So they're going to form at least a, a, a supermultiplet. So you see, eight fermionic zero modes means there are four creators and four annihilators. So I can write down the generic highest rate representation by starting with some representation of SL2 and SU2. So here, this is a representation of SL2. And for concreteness, I'll look at the continuous series representation. I could also do it, look at the discrete series representation. Doesn't really matter. And this labels the dimension of a representation of SU2. And I'll take this to be the, the top level of my, of my Fox space, of my, of my um, uh, Clifford representation with respect to the fermion. So it's annihilated by four of the fermionic generators. So I can ask, what's the, what is the multiplet that's generated by these four fermionic generators? And you know how this goes. So that you have the top state, then you can apply four times each of the fermionic generators once. So on the next level, we are going to get four representations. Then I can apply them twice, but because fermions are anti-commute, I have to two, apply two different fermions. So I'm going to get six level reps, states or representations at that level, and I'm going to get four and one. So this is going to be the structure of this uh, super multiplet. And which representations am I going to get? Well, remember, they transform in the by spinner representation. So therefore, they're going to, I have to take the tensor product with the two-dimensional representation with respect to SL2 and the two-dimensional representation with respect to SU2. And when you work this out, what you find is that basically that shifts the spin up by a half. So this is where both get shifted up, then this one gets shifted up, and this one gets shifted down, and then you can guess the pattern, right? So that's what happens after you have applied the first each of the generators once. Because <coughs> they sit in by spinner representations, it's basically a clebsch gordon coefficient, so the spin goes up or down for SL2, and the spin goes up or down for SU2, and you get all the four combinations. Okay. So you do this again. So when you do this again, there is one representation which you're going to get, which is going to look like this. Right? So so you can't apply the generator that lifts the spin of both of them again. So next time, if you want to lift the spin of this, you have to reduce the spin of this, and so on. And then there are six other terms, uh, five other terms. And then the, the terms here look exactly like the terms here, and the terms here look exactly like the terms here. That's the structure of the super multiplet, just applying the fermionic zero modes and keeping track of the representation theory of SO2 plus SU2. Now, what is significant about this? Yes. You assume this is all about the holomorphic... Uh, yes, this is only purely holomorphic. Right. But it assumes that uh, uh, there is a holomorphic factorization. Well, so I'm, I'm sitting at the wesemino witten point where there is a holomorphic factorization. Oh, non-compact. You have a non-compact group, so holomorphic factorization, as we know, let's say Newville is very questionable and there is other... Well, but I mean, for, I mean, if you look at the hybrid string of berkowitz rafovitz and you clearly have holomorphic currents and anti-holomorphic currents. I mean, so that's... This is in the Berkowitz's formalism. Yes, berkowitz rafovitz formalism. formalism. Oh, okay. So there you have... And I'm sitting at the Wessermino point, which is what is dual to the nervous schwartz vermont description at the Wessermino point. So there I have decoupled left and right currents. Uh, Samson is right. If I deform away, obviously this will break down. But at this point, this is true. Now, why is this interesting? Well, remember, we are going to look at P is U1, 1, 1 slash 2 at level 1. And this contains the subalgebra SL2R at level 1 plus SU2 at level 1. These bosonic subalgebras inherit the level from the super Lie algebra. But SU2 at level 1 is a very special affine Katzmodi algebra. It's a very special vertex operator algebra. It has only two possible highest rate representations namely the one-dimensional representation and the two-dimensional. The highest rate representation for SU2 level 1, but the structure of the vertex operator algebra requires that the only allowed representation is, in this convention, the one- and the two-dimensional representation of SU2. That's a very, very different level to what we had before, right? Well, so I'm here... SU2 at least. Yeah, so, so this is what has happened here, right? I'm going to PSU 1, 1, slash 2 at level K, and that contains SL2R plus SU2 at level K each. Yeah. I mean, this is the decoupling of the fermions has sort of 
is transmuted from the adjoint to the, to the spinner representation, and then this contains SO2 and SU2 level 1, but they, they interact with the fermions. The fermions are here not decoupled, and you can't decouple the fermions. So it's a, it's a different setup, but it's, it's like going from the schwarz ramon to green schwarz So it's, a, it's an alternative formulation of the same theory. Now, what's important is that this contains SU2 at level 1, and SU2 at level 1 only has two highest rate representations, the one-dimensional one and the two-dimensional one. But if you look at this generic supermultiplets, you see a problem. You see, even if you take this to be the one-dimensional one, you're going to get the three-dimensional one here. Right? But the three-dimensional one is not compatible with SU2 at level 1. So what this tells you is that the generic ground state multiplet, the generic super, super representation at the highest rate is not allowed for the theory at level one. This is specific to looking at the affine Katzmudi algebra at level one. If I looked at the affine Katzmudi algebra at level two, then obviously you also have the three-dimensional one allowed, and then I would have a generic multiplet. But at level one, I can't, because somehow it doesn't fit together with the SU2 level one representation theory. The other way of putting it is that there are null vectors from the SP2 sector, and they just are incompatible with a, a, a generic long representation. So then you have to ask, what are the allowed representations? Well, the allowed representations have to be short representations. So as people know, in supersymmetry, I mean, this is the whole concept of these BPS representations, they are the generic representations, where, where sort of half the fermions act non-trivially, and then a short representation where some of the fermions that would normally act non-trivially have to act trivially. And what we learn here is that for this affine Katzmudi algebra at level one, the only representations are short representations that have some shortening condition so that this term in the series doesn't appear. This term is not allowed to appear because this is not compatible with the SU2 level one representation theory. So what you find is, if you analyze this, there's really only one representation that's possible. And the representation that's possible is a short representation. So this is purely representation theory of P is U1, 1, 1 slash 2 at level 1, the FN Katzmudi algebra representation theory. And what you find is that for P is U1, 1, 1 slash 2 at level 1, so they have the vacuum representation where all the fermionic generators act trivially. And then the other representation is the short representation that looks as follows. You have a... Sorry, you, you kind of maybe I'm a bit confused. You say they act trivially, but they form a Clifford algebra, right? Or not? Or right. But I mean, I mean, you know that you can construct in the affine Katzmudi algebra, you can simply set all the Lie algebra zero modes to zero, right? In the vacuum representation of the, of the, Lie, of the affine Katzmudi algebra, the zero modes all act trivially, right? And that's also a consistent representation. Well, but experiments, do they form a Clifford algebra or not, the zero modes? Well, I mean, but when I say they form a Clifford algebra, on the right-hand side, you have bosonic generators appearing, right? Oh, so okay, okay. so mm -hmm. it, there is one consistent representation where you said all the zero modes okay. act trivially. Okay. That's the vacuum representation, which every affine Katzmudi algebra will necessarily have. And then the only other representation that exists is a short representation that sort of sits in there. And I'm writing here it slightly differently. So from the point of view of over there, I should have, uh, I would have to start with this term. This term would stand at the top, and this term would stand in the, at the bottom. And it's, uh, it's this representation that contains three factors. That's the only representation that's compatible. And then furthermore, the fact that it is a short representation, I mean, as, as we just discussed, you see, this is a Clifford algebra, except on the right-hand side, you have some generators. Mm -hmm. And in order for this to be allowed to be short, what you find that J has to be equal to a half. So the representation theory of this affine uh, super Lie algebra, apart from the vacuum representation, is really only one representation. And it singles out the spinner half representation of this one. This one is to be a half. So alpha can be arbitrary. So this, this is, in fact, the only representation that's possible. So this n is not 0? So, so, so this n is 1. This is this term. 
and then and then and then you, you, you keep this guy and you keep one guy down here and all the others you set to zero. It's an ultra short representation. Not the same picture. Yeah, it's not the same picture. Flip the picture. Yeah, the top level below. Yeah. So this is the top level the top level here I've written. And when you say vacuum it's zero, is that it? So the vacuum representation is I mean that's another representation, right? So that's any zero and just confused. So, so no, the vacuum representation is when all the fermionic, when all the zero mode act trivially. So, I mean, that's sort of in some sense. That well, it's, how does SU2, I mean, the other ones. Right, so, so here you would pick the vacuum representation, and here you would pick one. <laughs> and then you would set all the fermionic zero modes to zero. That's an allowed representation. I mean, I would have to write down the anti commutation relations for you to see this, but every Lee algebra. I mean, every affine Fatsumudi algebra has a vacuum representation where you take all the zero modes to act trivially. That's the vacuum representation. And then the only non-trivial representation is this one. Yes, sir. So what is n exactly? n is the dimension of the SU2. So this is the one, that's the trivial representation of SU2. Ah, oh, so it is zero. I meant zero, yeah. I yeah, yeah. Sorry, I mean, I'm, yeah, it's, I'm, it's zero. the problem is if you have j here, I would like to write j here, but then I would be blamed for using the same symbol twice. So this is the dimension of SU2. This is a very physicist way of labeling it, and that is the spin of it. So of course, the point is that somehow, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you look, think about this induction thing, then of course the two is, 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 is corresponds to zero, in fact. So this crossing out, you see, it, it is, oh, sorry. So what you crossed out there is in principle, is, is zero in, in, um, in representation. It's representation is zero, yeah. So, I mean, this is, so it's not so surprising. So if, if, you, if you start with this state and you apply two certain fermionic zero modes, you simply get zero. The character, the induced character, is zero. Yes. So it's, it's, it's consistent. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, this is one way of deriving this. You can also derive it in some other way. I mean, this algebra just has plenty of null vectors. I mean, for example, it has a null vector in the SU2 sector, but then via the fermionic zero modes, it produces a null vector. For example, there's a conformal embedding of this stress energy tensor plus this and stress energy tensor is equal to this stress energy tensor at level one. Mm -hmm. And uh, different ways in which you can check it and you find this is the only representation that's compatible. It's purely representation theoretic, whichever way you want to analyze. So for some skeptics who think that SU1, comma one Vesumina Witten model is difficult to solve, you're saying that PSU1, comma one slash two, after I add this slash two, then it becomes simple. At level one. At level one. At level one. At level one, this becomes very simple. Because somehow the representation is very collapses. That really only, apart from the trivial there representation, is really only one representation. There are two tricks. One is putting slash two, yes. and another is picking level one. Yes. Yes. If we have remove these two tricks, then I would say that SU1, one. Absolutely. SU1, one, comma one is hard. I mean, that's, that's why I got grilled on my take one. I mean, SL2 Arves Amino Witten model is hard because you have to worry about all sorts of things, but somehow here it's so much cleaner. And I mean, part of the reason why this is so clean is that this theory actually has a free field realization. Only without screening charges? Yeah, but I, I, I'll explain to you. Actually, strictly speaking, this algebra has a free field realization u1, 1, 1 slash 2 at level 1. And it has a free field realization in terms of what people call symplectic bosons and fermions. So we have four free fermions, which are of the form psi alpha r chi beta s. This is epsilon alpha beta delta r minus s. And then we have the symplectic bosons that satisfy basically the same relation, except they satisfy commutators rather than anti-commutators. And the bilinears of them, they generate the super affine Lie algebra u1, 1, 1 slash 2. Only level. for level 1, that's true. That's only true for level 1, yeah. I mean, it's, you see, I mean, it's basically the, as you know, SU2 at level 1 has a free field realization. And I've written the free field realization basically in terms of free fermions. And then this basically gives you the free field realization for SL2 at level 1. And then the fermions are the bilinear terms between them. So this gives you u1, 1, 1 slash 2 at level 1. And then in order to go to SU2, you have to divide out, you have to gauge a u1. So what you have to do is you have to restrict yourself 
to the states that are of the form z and phi is equal to zero, where n is uh, greater or equal than zero, and z is a certain linear combination of bilinears of the two u1s that live inside this. So I don't really want to write down all the details. This is something that will be discussed in the exercise session this afternoon uh, by bit. So he, on the example sheet, we'll write down all the relations, and you can check it to your heart's delight. And he will, he will show you how you reproduce this representation from the free field realization. So the way this works is that this algebra is basically two representations, the Neve Schwartz sector and the Ramon sector. The Neve Schwartz sector gives you this. So Neve Schwartz sector means everybody is half integer moded. And if you take everybody integer moded, then you get this representation. And that's basically the only representations which this algebra has. And you get these representations once you insist that a certain U1 charge is equal to zero, and that fixes this spin to be equal to a half. So this is a, it's a very elementary, I mean, you'll see it on the example sheet, and it's uh, as concrete as you want. It's not, uh, not, not no, no magic, no string theoretic uh, waving of hands involved. So this is, uh, this is simply what this, uh, what this world sheet theory is, and therefore this world sheet theory, this hybrid formalism at level one, and only at level one, has a very, very simple description. It's basically free fields more to those on coset conditions. Is this clear? So, so, so that will be the key towards understanding uh, the spectrum. And then you can also understand, so, so OK, so this is the highest weight representation. And then we have to do, so in order to reproduce the Maldesina augury description, you have to introduce also spectrally flowed sectors here to mirror what happened over there. So here, we can define spectral flow, and you can define spectral flow directly in terms of the free fields. So spectral flow in terms of the free fields, so we need spectral flow as before, and spectral flow in terms of the real fields, of the free fields, acts as follows, sigma w of psi plus minus n is equal to psi plus minus n minus plus w over 2, and I mean I can so eta does the opposite sigma w of eta does the opposite and then the fermions do their thing oh, sorry it does the same so you can write down spectral flow and then you apply the same mechanism that we had and a similar formula for the fermions so there's a formula for the fermions that uh, takes the same Likewise for the chi's. So that's, uh, that's the, how the spectral flow acts on these three fields. And then when you trace it through, this induces exactly the spectral flow on the PSU 1, 1 slash 2 currents that we could correspond to the spectral flow from the Maldesina Aguri description. So this is just the this sort of translation of the spectrally flowed sectors from the Neve Schwartz Vermont formalism to the Vermont for, uh, to the to the hybrid formalism. So at the end of the day, what we are going to have our space of states of this conformal field theory is the sum. And there's still again, honestly, there's still an integral because you see this alpha parameter is still uh, arbitrary. So you have an, an integral over alpha, and then you basically have sigma of w on this representation. So this representation we call f. So f f uh, alpha is the affine representation whose ground states are described by this uh, representation of the zero modes. And then you basically just have alpha alpha, and it's a sigma w of the alpha bar. And that is the full space of states of the, of the uh, PSU 1, 1 slash 2 part of, uh, that appears in the hybrid formalism. And then you have to add to it the topologically twisted uh, uh, torus sector and then that defines your world sheet theory. So that's a very concretely defined theory. And here everything is very explicit. It's all free fields, so you have this under as good control as well. And now you can ask uh, what's going to happen when you analyze the physical states. So remember, there was another thing that we didn't quite know what excitations survive once you go to the physical states. So now what happens when you go to the physical states? And uh, you can do this more carefully, but 
the gist of the argument is if you just count how many, say, bosonic excitations we have, you see you have four bosonic uh, uh, boson field, right? Alpha and beta run over plus minus, so we have four symplectic bosons. But then we know that the physical state condition will remove two bosonic degrees of freedom. So there will be minus two bosonic degrees of freedom from the string theory of physical state condition. And then this condition, the Zn condition, the condition that reduces u1, 1, 1 slash 2 to p as u1, 1, 1 slash 2 will also eat two bosonic degrees of freedom. Because you see, Z. The condition that Zn is equal to zero removes one set of oscillators, but then because the commutator of Zn with itself is zero, it also removes another set of oscillators. So the Zn condition then removes another set of two bosonic uh, degrees of freedom from the Zn condition. And what you learn from that is that you basically remove all the excitation modes coming from the ADS3 cross S3 factor, and therefore the only thing that survives are the excitation modes coming from the T4 sector, and therefore that looks, and then the, the L0 argument that I wrote down from last time goes through essentially unmodified, so then you get really direct, directly the symmetric orbifold of T4, because the only excitations that survive, you see the SU2 has now disappeared, there are no excitations anymore from the SU2, because this describes the entire ADS3 cross S3 fit. So what you learn from this is that from the entire ADS3 cross S3 factor, no bosonic oscillations survive. They're all pure gauge. And the only oscillation degrees of freedom survive from the T4. And then this Maschel condition calculation tells you that the physical states look exactly like the symmetric orbifold of T4. And there's some fermions remaining. That, yeah, so, so, so you do a, a similar argument for the fermions. So if you just explain it for the bosons and then you see that you get the four fermions and the four bosons from the T4 survive, and you get just the symmetric orbifold of T4. Can you remind what is the power? What do you mean, the power? Oh, it's a symmetric whatever. Ah, so it's a symmetric orbifold in the end goes to infinity limit. Yes, and that's the reason why k was equal to 1? Well, you had the, somehow I probably missed the reason why well, so the reason is that, so this theory has a large W infinity symmetry. So this is really dual to a tensionless string theory. And the tensionless string theory should correspond to the small radius limit. And that's the motivation where you should look at level k equals to 1. k equals to 1 is the small radius limit. Yeah, so k equals to 1 is the consequence of that condition. Yes. So if you take k bigger than 1, you don't reproduce the symmetric orbifold of T4. You produce additional stuff. And, and, and you see this here. You see, if you don't take k equals to 1, you get big representation. The representation theory becomes much, much bigger. Your spectrum becomes much, much, much bigger. It doesn't look at all like the symmetric orbifold. There is no statement about finite n. No, so we are not making any statement on finite n. What we are making is we are looking at the n goes to infinity limit. But as I'll explain tomorrow, but I'm not sure you'll be around, the 1 over n corrections we can reproduce from the world sheet in terms of the correlation functions. You know that the correlation function, the 1 over n corrections, should come from the higher genus contributions on the world sheet. And we'll see this explicitly, that that's how the world sheet reproduces the 1 over n corrections of the symmetric orbifold correlates. But what you take here is you take n to infinity. And you have to take is remember, we want to have, uh, uh, I said that this the spectral flow. Oh, sorry, I forgot to have the sum over w. The spectral flow is to be identified with the length of the single cycle twisted sector. But the spectral flow can be as large as you want. And therefore, you must have single cycle sectors as large as possible. So therefore, this only fits with the n goes to infinity limit of the symmetric orbifold, right? The, conjugacy, the single cycle conjugacy classes of the symmetric orbifold of Sn would stop at n. But obviously, on the world sheet side, we, don't, we can't terminate w at n. w runs over all positive integers. So this is how the, the spectrum appears in this hybrid formalism. And you see that the, the, the tightness of it really happens at level one. And it's due to the representation theory of this super affine algebra. And it's, <coughs> it's purely representation theoretic in nature. So in this uh, um, case, Maldacena conjecture is just a statement that the symmetric orbital CFT at n equals infinity is ADS3 times S3 times T4 level one. Correct. 
Yes. That's what has to be proven. I mean, that's what effectively our, our analysis shows. What we, we do is we construct the level one theory and we show that its physical spectrum, as you calculate on the world sheet, reproduces exactly the single particle spectrum of the n goes to infinity limit of the symmetric orbit fold. And so this is perturbative, so n has gone to infinity, but the 1 over n corrections are correctly accounted for. But the finite n corrections are not. Finite n corrections would be non-perturbative from the point of view of the world sheet that we don't know how to do. But it does it at n goes to infinity, but including all 1 over n corrections. So previous attempts were actually for finite n, and you are saying that that was too much to want. Well, I mean, previous, I think people also tried n goes to infinity, but uh, people just, I think they, I mean, no, nobody had managed to find a world sheet description that would, I mean, you know, there was a long, I mean, it was part of the folklore that the Maldesino or Gori theory could not have anything possibly to do with the symmetric orbifold, and the reason was that this theory has these representations, this continuous series representation with this free parameter, so people said this is a continuum of states, and the symmetric orbifold of T4 doesn't have a continuum. So people always said this can't possibly be related to one another. And the way around is that at level one, somehow this theory doesn't have this continuous sector because this representation theory gets frozen at J equals to a half. And at that point, it matches exactly the symmetric orbifold spectrum. So you have this parameter alpha, which is continuous. Right. But remember, the alpha parameter gets effectively fixed by the mass shell condition. When you look at any excitation state, that basically fixed alpha. So, so when you calculate the, the spectrum here, you reproduce exactly the correct spectrum. And you don't have short representation for the discrete series? No, the discrete, you see, the, you could play the same argument for the discrete series. You would run into the same issue. The only state that would, allow, would remain is J equals to a half. The shortening condition just hinges on the value of the Casimir. It doesn't hinge on whether it's the discrete representation or the, the discrete series representation or the continuous series representation. Well, you see, I mean, in some sense, this is contained. When alpha is equal to a half, then this representation is sort of, ah, okay. I mean, the continuous, the continuous series representation with alpha equal to a half is, in some sense, the direct sum of d plus and d minus at a half. OK, so this is how the, how the spectrum gets reproduced in this way. And here, we get a clean answer to these problems I had last time, namely, why am I only looking at this series of representations? And uh, how does the state counting really work? And you can really do this very explicitly, and you get exactly the symmetric orbifold spectrum in the n goes to infinity limit. Now, this is reproducing the spectrum, but I've been mentioning the fact that uh, we would like to, sh so this is n goes to infinity, but I keep saying that this is in some sense also capturing 1 over n. So in order to explain that, I have to explain how the correlation functions between the two descriptions are related to one another. So what can we say about correlation functions? So, so what we have here is sort of the hybrid string at k equals to 1. And on the other side, we have the symmetric orbifold of t4. And in order to explain uh, how, how correlation functions uh, match, I first want to explain to you how you calculate the correlation functions in the symmetric orbifold of T4. That's old stuff. I mean, I'm just reviewing what people knew about the correlation functions from here. And then I have to explain to you how we're going to get it from the hybrid description. I mean, you have, to, you have to calculate both sides. So I have to start somewhere. So I'm going to start on this side. So now I'm no world sheet. I'm just looking at the symmetric orbifold of T4, a 2D CFT, and I'm asking how can I calculate correlation functions. Now, I'm, in the following, I'm going to concentrate on the correlators that involve just statistics like the ground state. So what I'm going to want to calculate are things like sigma w1 of z1, sigma w2 of z2, sigma wn of z Actually, I should call them x, because from now on, it will be important that there are two coordinates. One is the coordinate of the 2D CFT living here, and this coordinate I will always denote by x. And then here, this is a world sheet theory, the world sheet coordinate I will always denote by z. So this will be very important that there are really two sets of coordinates. So these are the correlation functions living on the boundary of ADS3. So the, the spatial boundary of ADS3, the, 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 the boundary of the cylinder, on, on that boundary I choose my coordinate x. And what I would calculate in the symmetric orbifold of T4 is, for example, a correlation function 
of the twisted sector and states, and these are the twisted sector ground states. of the symmetric orbit. Okay. So this X lives in T4? No, no, this X lives on, on a sphere, right? I mean, so I'm looking at, so here this is a sphere, a, a, a perfectly conventional Riemann sphere. It's the sphere on which my 2D CFT lives. I mean, I could look, look at a complex plane, but CFT people like to put it on the sphere. But I'm thinking of, I mean, this is a 2D CFT. And this T2D CFT has a home. And this the is home? From, from this ADS3, right? So, so again? This is from the ADS3. No, this is, I mean, so this, this is the boundary of the ADS3. Yes, okay. so, so ADS3 is basically a cylinder, a solid cylinder. And the, the 2D CFT lives on the perimeter of the cylinder, which is the mantle of the cylinder. Actually, so I don't think. In plus and minus infinity, I can think of it as being a sphere. And this symmetric orbifold is a CFT that lives on that sphere just like we live on the surface of the Earth. But we didn't only have ADS3, we had more, right? right. What about this? So, so you look at these degrees of freedom and you look at it from the point of view of the ant living on the boundary of the cylinder. So you see, as a field theory living on, I mean, it's like, it's like what Samson was saying yesterday. You can look at the gauge theory in three dimensions. And you can think of it with respect to the perspective of a two-dimensional person, then you just get infinitely many fields, right? I mean, you get the Fourier components, right? Yeah. So similarly here, I'm thinking of this from the point of view of the 2D CFT. And okay. all the additional degrees of freedom will just be more and more fields. But I don't think you will be using the fact that it's a boundary. It's completely, you can ignore it. Yes. I, I'm I'm over, some people think it is not correct way to think of boundaries. Okay. Yes. It's not two-dimensional. Who cares? I'm, uh, okay, nobody cares. That's this correct. Is, this is, this is the, the conventional picture, but I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to analyze correlation functions of this DCFT that has its home on this sphere, which morally some people may want to think of as being the boundary of ADS3. Okay, so, so how do I calculate a correlation functions of this kind? Just, just to be sure, because I'm now a little bit getting lost. But anyway, <laughs> so this, this, the sigma w is roughly the same sigma w that you have there? Again, so, so here, so now we are on the right hand side. No, I know, I know. I'm right? so, so the w, the spectral, the, the twist sector, was related to the spectral flow, and this spectral flow is still this spectral. So it so is roughly the same. It is the same. So, so the, the field in the symmetric orbifolds that is, comes from the twist sector W lives in the hybrid description the W cycle twisted sector. In the, sorry, in the W spectrally flowed sector. Yeah. So it's always the same W, but, but sigma, now, sigma, just sigma. concentrating here. I'm not talking about AD3 right. for but the moment. Sigma so itself, sigma. sigma is a field, right? Or oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, so so ah, this is, yeah. ah, now I've done my... So, yeah, this is, uh, this is I don't know, this is meant Five. to be the ground state of the... Yeah, 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 this, yeah, this sigma is, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Very, very bad. Not quite, not quite Samsung level yet, but getting oh. there. <laughs> I survived, I survived. Yeah, and I just goofed, but anyway. So these are the, the ground states of the W cycle twist detector, and I'm asking what are these correlators? And uh, what's the smart way of calculating these correlators? And this has nothing to do with ADS-CFT. This is, um, Malouli and Matua studied this, and other people studied this before, and there's a, you can ask what's the smartest way of calculating this correlator? And the smartest way of calculating this correlator is that you go, uh, that, you, that you try to lift your, your correlator from, from this sphere to some, to some other Riemann surface. You see, remember, what, what is this uh, W cycle twisted sector field? What this means is that, that uh, you see, near phi W, when you take some of these axes and you take them around, they get permuted by, so this, uh, so x1 becomes x2, and x2 becomes x3, and x3 becomes x4 as you go around, right? So this is, this is the twisted sector ground state. And the twisted sector ground state for w means w corresponds to the cycle permutation 1 goes up to w, and what it means is that the, say, the field d phi 1 becomes d phi 2 when I go around, and d phi 2 becomes d phi 3. Remember, right? You don't? Uh, okay, now phi and phi, so, so oh, yeah. they can get really... No, I don't. Okay, um, so, so, yeah, see, I wanted to call it sigma w. Okay. 
So this is a different sigma than this sigma. Okay. And that's the phi from before? That's, that's the phi of the T4, right? The T4 has a D phi, but I have n copies of the T4. And I'm saying the first copy of the T4, once I move it around, becomes the second copy of the T4. And then it becomes the third copy, and the W's copy, and then it goes back. That's what the twisted sectors... Remember when I discussed the symmetric orbifold, I said the twisted sectors are those states where you only come back up to the action of the orbifold group. And the orbifold generator that I'm looking at is this guy. It's the W cycle twisted sector. So you come back up to the action of a cyclic permutation of order W. But this sigma of W is this phi W up there? Or it, yeah, yeah, exactly. This is, so this is the, the twisted sector ground state. So any field in the twisted sector corresponding to this. To the, so, 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 the, so remember, the twisted sectors uh, in one, one to one correspondence with the conjugacy classes. And then I said I only want to look at the single cycle sectors because these are the single string fields. And the single cycle sectors are, are, just, uh, are just of the form 1 up to w. And they're characterized by that the fields of my, of my sort of parent theory get permuted by this permutation as I go around. So if this is the w cycle twisted sector, this is an order w cyclic permutation that the fields experience as they go around. Now, if I want to sort of undo this, what I want to do, the smart way of calculating these correlation functions, is to find the, cover, the covering map that undoes this process. So if here is my x space, I want to find a map from a z space. So this will be some Riemann surface. This is the sphere on which my on which my symmetric orbifold theory really lives. And what I want to find is a map gamma, a holomorphic map gamma of z, that has the property that it undoes this process near each of the points. So it should have the property that gamma of z is equal to xi plus ai times z minus zi to the wi for zi for z near zi. So here there are the special points x1, x2, x3 to xn, where I insert my twist fields. And I'm going to have special points up here, z1, z2, z3, up to zn. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the correlation function here, and I'm applying a conformal transformation, lifting it up to a conformal to a correlator up here. And up here, because of this factor, this has become single valued. So up here, the fact that I had these twist field insertions, they are invisible. And therefore, this correlation function becomes the vacuum correlation function after this conformal transformation. And therefore, the whole information about this correlation function is captured in the conformal factor that's associated to this holomorphic covering map. So that's the trick. The trick is to calculate this correlation function of the twisted sector fields by lifting them up to some auxiliary surface namely some Riemann surface, so that you undo this funny monotromy behavior. But, but you know, there are conformal dimensions of sigma. You're saying the conformal factor, so it will be just a product of gamma prime. Absolutely, gamma. yes, exactly, yes. So, you, I mean, you can just read it off from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so the smartest way of calculating this is by finding the holomorphic covering map and then calculating the conformal factor, and that gives you all there is to know about this correlator down here. Now, and I'm here, so I want to give a little bit of a, of a preview. Now, when you, when you analyze the correlation functions down here, and remember, we are in the inverse to infinity limit, you can ask, how do these correlators depend on n? And what you find is they depend on n in a sort of remarkable fashion. So I'll, 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 I'll briefly try to explain. I know I'm a little bit over time, although I started a little bit late. But uh, I've been so disciplined so far, maybe I'm allowed a little bit over time today. <laughs> so if you look at the, the behavior of these correlation functions, what you find is that these correlation functions, or I call them again sigma w1 and so on, when you analyze them, in terms of their 1 over n behavior, they go like n to the minus 1 
minus g minus n over 2, where g is the genus of this surface. So the covering surface needn't necessarily have g to 0. In fact, the correct prescription is you find all the covering maps, you sum over all the covering maps. From each covering map, you calculate a conformal factor. And what you see is that a 1 over n behavior of this correlator, if you think of it at large n, is suppressed by the genus of the corresponding covering surface that appears order by order as you have The surface has moduli, right? Yeah. Well, as we'll see, the, these moduli are all fixed. Because you see, covering surfaces typically don't exist. Covering surfaces are very delicate objects. You have to finely tune this surface so that it covers this. So, so the previous argument you, that you, you explained, once you find the cover, you know the cover later, but now all of a sudden you want to sum over covers. This well, was not part well, of a package. No, but I mean, I think here, when, when, when you calculate it, you have to sum over all possible covers. Well, why that? I, I think the argument is, I do a conformal transformation. I mean, if I find one... Well, but I think I'm, there are... I mean, well. It has to do with the fact that you see, you make some choices in writing down these correlation I mean, when, when you write this down, then... Oh, but, but there's only one covering. No, no, no. There's in general, more than one covering map. Uh, well, if you, you fix, if you fix the monodromy to be Zn around these points, there's still more covering. Yeah, there's, there's in general more than one. I mean, it's not... Uh, I mean, there are, there are covering maps at different genes. There's a finite set of covering maps. They are discrete. And the prescription for how to calculate these correlators is that you sum over all of them. The covers are of different genus normally, right? Yes. So, yeah, so they come from different. Yeah, they come over genus is like kind of start thinking that it has. Right. So, so, but I mean, from a CFT perspective, mm -hmm. so the way people yeah. describe this is that you sum over all the covering maps, and then you calculate the conformal factor of each of the covering maps, and then when you study the one over n behavior, you see that the one over n behavior is controlled by the genus of this covering. Now, this is a formula that's extremely suggestive because remember, G string under the ADS CFT dictionary, G string should go like one over, in, in three dimensions, it's one over square root of n. So, therefore, this contribution go like, goes like um, G string to the uh, So therefore, what this suggests is, but if you think about it from a string theoretic perspective, what that suggests is that that's the contribution in string theory that comes from a genus G world sheet. So, so this looks like that the contribution, so when I sum over all of these covering maps, the contribution that comes from genus G, under this dictionary back to ADS3, I should expect it to come from a genus G world sheet, because that's how the world sheets of higher genus contribute to a string amplitude. They come with g-string to the genes. And so what this suggests is that this auxiliary covering surface that you just invent out of thin air here as a way of calculating this correlation function should be identified with the world sheet of the dual CUT. So that's, that's what this picture suggests. What this picture suggests is that somehow the way this correlation function should emerge is that this covering map should really be the map from the world sheet to the dual CFT. And so what it suggests is that the, that the world sheet correlators so I mean this is, a, this is a, at this moment this is an inspired guess to explain this picture. What you would think so in the world sheet you're going to have these uh, vertex operators they'll be labeled by W and they'll be labeled by Z1 and x1, they'll be labeled by the, the position on the world sheet and the position in the symmetric orbifold CFT. So what you would expect is that that should be equal to the sum over all the covering maps, some conformal factor times the delta function that fixes the zi's such that gamma exists. So what is z and x here again? So, so, so x so x is the coordinate in the dual CFT. But in the world sheet theory, the world sheet is another 2D space, right? And you have to calculate correlation functions on the two-dimensional world sheet. So this is the world sheet coordinate. And 
and x is some projection of it? Or oh, no, x, x is the coordinate. I mean, so what we have to do is we have going, and I'll explain this next time how you define them. You have to define vertex operators that describe the insertion of the, say, twisted sector ground state at position x on the boundary. That will correspond to a specific vertex operator. But the vertex vertex operator will also depend on z. And then when you do the usual string theory uh, analysis in string theory, you have to integrate over the zi, over the string moduli space. So when you, when you, when you integrate these, uh, these correlation functions, then these delta functions will guarantee that this integral just becomes a finite sum. It just becomes a finite sum over gamma, c gamma, and it therefore just reproduces the symmetric orbifold answer. Uh, what is c gamma, sorry? c gamma is the conformal factor associated to this. I mean, I, I'm so, being... Sorry. So, so do I understand correctly, actually, so what's happening is the following, is that you're looking at infinitely many, a permit, in, an infinite permutation group, yes. and then there you look at the conjugacy class of a cycle of, say, W elements. So there's, of course, only one conjugacy class. Yes. Now you're saying we take n, little n conjugacy classes of different length, yes. and so that the product is zero, or a product is trivial. Well, That's the product is trivial in the sense that it is in the direct sense. Representative so that the product is zero. Exactly. So, so now, but the point is that now you cannot take all of them to be the first answer. Right. So that, I mean, and this is, this is the combinatorial exactly. problem. Yeah, you yeah. look at this up to conjugation, and there is a finite number of solutions. But that's basically taking that's by the covering map. The covering map takes care No, I'm just translating that. That's, I'm just saying what yes. that means. Yeah. And then for each of them, you have this gamma z, and then you sum of those. Right. Yeah. And now I'm saying, how, how could I reproduce this from the world sheet? Now, from the world sheet, every of these vertex operators will also depend on z, because they sit somewhere on my 2D world sheet, and I have to do an integral over them. So what I would expect is that these correlators will have a delta function type behavior, so that when I do this integral, I'm just going to localize to the individual covering maps, and I reproduce this answer. So, so this is the prediction that's sort of naturally suggested by the setup, and what this predicts is that our funny hybrid theory should have the property that these correlation functions have this very surprising localization property. That's not what your normal CFT looks like. Your normal CFT is a rational function of the Z. It doesn't have delta function uh, support. So what it suggests is that these correlators have this remarkable property. And what I'm going to show you next time is that that's something we can prove. We can prove that these correlation functions have indeed the property that they're only non-zero if the zi's align in such a way that a holomorphic covering map exists such that the zi's get mapped to the xi's in this fashion. And furthermore, this restricts exa has exactly the right co-dimension so that when you do this integral, you soak up exactly as many integrations as there are delta functions. So in particular, as Samson mentioned, at higher genus, you also have to integrate over the moduli, let's say, of the torus. But the, uh, uh, the covering map problem has a co-dimension so that exactly all the integrations are always soaked up by the delta functions, and you always end up with a finite sum. And uh, so what I'm going to explain to you next time is that the word identities of our, hybrid, of our hybrid description prove that these correlation functions have indeed this behavior. I, I'm, I won't be able to calculate this coefficient, but I'll be able to show you that they have this delta function localization. It's delta two. It's a two-dimensional, it's yes. not all well, it's, a, it's, a, well, it's a, a, a high dimension, it's a co-dimension, whatever. So for I mean, for Z, which is well, a point. Sorry, well, I mean, I mean, you know, there are four. probably maybe. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm really <laughs> running out of time now. No, I've overstepped my. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's stop here. Okay. Well, <laughs>